In late November 1950, after the big push into North Korea by United Nations forces, elements of the 17th U.S. Infantry reached a point on the Yalu River. This, the border of Manchuria, was the objective of MacArthur's End the War campaign. Everything had been going well for our side since the Inchon landing and the breakthrough at the Pusan perimeter in mid-September. And then something happened. The Chinese came into the war. Suddenly, the effective enemy strength increased about 300%. The word came that all United Nations ground forces were to withdraw southward. As General MacArthur put it, this was an entirely new war. By now, we were opposed by great masses of Chinese troops and were greatly outnumbered. A rapid retreat to the south had to be made in the face of this massive threat. The enemy push was about to carry him all the way to below Seoul in South Korea, his second big attempt to push us off the peninsula. The C-119s operating from a Shia air base in southern Japan airdropped supplies to our withdrawing ground forces. Operations possible only because our air forces maintained air superiority. All through this period of retreat, the boxcars dropped much needed ammunition, food and medical supplies, as well as heavy stuff such as vehicles and artillery pieces. When our ground forces were compelled to pull back, the United Nations air power became the only means of effectively opposing the advance of the formidable Chinese army. This was the last week of November 1950 and the first half of December. The F-80s went up and hit the enemy close to our line. And there were also a great many interdiction and reconnaissance missions. It was our air strength again, as it was at the beginning of the conflict six months before, that prevented the envelopment of our withdrawing ground forces. The enemy was slowed down because we inflicted a tremendous number of casualties among his personnel, and because we kept on hitting his increasingly extended supply lines. This went on until in mid-December 1950 we were able to stabilize a line near the 38th parallel. In one month, our air forces flew more than 11,000 combat sorties. At this time, the middle of December 1950, our F-86s went into action against the MiGs. And now began one of the brightest chapters in the story of our air forces in the Korean conflict. Here we are in the pilot briefing room of an F-86 squadron. Oh, fighter sweep a day. In this area right here. We'll start engines as uh, indicated on, on the board. Here's the plan. Tiger flight, you take off. Come through this area here. Right on up to here, where you make a right turn, come about 30 miles inland, and hook back in. Eagle flight, you'll follow Tiger. You'll come out this area here, up to this point here where you make a left turn, hook back in. The last two flights, Wolf and Robin, will take off and come up to the center, this point here, where they'll cut right up in to the uh, Yellow River cutting short of the yellow, where they'll split, one doing a right turn, and Wolf will make a, a left turn. Now, uh, the first four flights into the area will stay below the contrails and keep a uh, close watch on the fighter bombers. The last two flights will go above the contrails and check very closely for any MiG aircraft that might come in above the cons. Now, if you see MiGs up there today, call them out. Give their altitude, direction, and geographical location on the, on the map, and call it out and then get off the radio. Now remember, once you look around, keep your speed up, and if you do get a bounce, cut him off, and drive in, in range. When you get in range, shoot, and when you shoot, shoot the kill. 
Anybody got any questions? Okay, let's go get them. Now for MiG Alley, that wide band of airspace over northwest Korea infested by the enemy jets. Sixes had this great advantage over the Russian-built MiGs. They were better handled. Simply as aircraft, the MiGs were at least the equal of the F-86s, and the enemy had a lot of them. They usually outnumbered the F-86s, sometimes by as much as three or four to one. But our pilots were much more skillful than theirs. This was the big reason that we destroyed eight times as many of their fighters as they did of ours. During the entire war, 827 MiGs were down. We lost 112 jet aircraft in air-to-air -air combat. Tiger Meek, uh, Tiger 2 here. Uh, got a couple of bogeys out there. We're coming around at 2 level. All right, you're going to... January 1951, the United Nations ground forces mounted a counterattack from the line of their furthest withdrawal. They pounded their way from below the 38th parallel and through the Iron Triangle. By June, the Reds were ready for an armistice. The battle line of mid-June was to remain more or less stabilized throughout the coming peace talks. In this building at Kaesong, the truce negotiations began in July 1951. A couple of weeks previously, the Russian delegate to the United Nations had made it clear that the Reds had had enough. General Nam Il of the North Korean Army was the spokesman for the enemy. The United Nations delegation was headed by Vice Admiral Joy of the United States Navy and included Major General Craigie of the Air Force, General Pike Sun Yup of the South Korean Army, and Rear Admiral Burke. After a year of fighting, there now began two years of talk. But during all that time, air assaults on the enemy were going to continue. After 21 months of dispute, chiefly over the problem of prisoners, an agreement was reached, at least on the exchange of sick and wounded. In April 1953, Operation Little Switch began. To Panmunjom, communist ambulances brought, at the rate of 100 a day, about 600 United Nations prisoners. Little Switch, this operation, was followed some months later by Big Switch, the large-scale exchange of the rest of the prisoners. Shortly after Little Switch got underway, the Reds were eager to resume the armistice talks, which had been suspended by the exasperated United Nations delegation the preceding autumn. All through the nearly two years of wrangling at Kaesong, 
our air forces had been hammering away at the enemy ground forces and communications and airfields and transport. The communists were ready to quit. So at Panmunjom on 27 July 1953, the Korean conflict ends, not in a peace, but in a ceasefire, an armed truce. Lieutenant General William K. Harrison, chief negotiator for the United Nations, signs the agreement, followed by General Nam Il for the North Koreans. So ended a mean war. But for the first time, communist designs on the free world had been stopped by military force. This was something that had to be done. And in its achievement, a large share of the credit belongs to the United States Air Force. The success of our jet pilots stands forth boldly in the records. 39 of them became aces in the Korean conflict. Each of the 39 destroyed five or more enemy MiGs. To name only a few, Lieutenant Colonel George A. Davis, Jr., 14 MiGs destroyed. Captain Joseph McConnell, Jr., 16 kills. Colonel Royal N. Baker, 13 MiGs downed. Captain Harold Fisher, Jr., 10 destroyed. Major Manuel J. Fernandez, 14 and a half kills. Colonel Francis S. Gabreski, six and a half, on top of his 31 kills over Germany. Major James Jibera, first Korean ace, 15 enemy jets destroyed. Colonel Harrison Thing, five MiGs downed. Captain Ivan C. Kinchelow, five kills. Colonel James K. Johnson, 10 MiGs destroyed. To our 39 Korean aces, indeed to all of our pilots who took part in the air battle, go praise and honor from us all. Splendidly, they upheld the national cause and the highest standards of the United States Air Force. <laughs>